All right, I'm here with legend Donnie Mickey at C. Milton Wright. Uh, there's a rumor going around that you're making a comeback. Let's confirm your return to coaching and what changed your mind. Um, I will be coming back next year. Uh, the, the biggest thing that I didn't factor into when I stepped down was being here and seeing the kids every day and then not working with them after school. Um, and I just missed it. Okay. Uh, over the years, you built a very strong program here at C. Milton Wright that especially on the distance side was a perennial favorite. How was the team when you first started and how did you maintain that success? Uh, the, I mean, C. Milton Wright's always been really, really strong. Before I got here, the girls had won a couple of state championships and they had uh, Bob and Barb Johnson were awesome coaches. Murray Davis was awesome. Um, and then what I just tried to do is just maintain it. And then when I got here, the team hovered around 50 or 60 kids and there's always safety in numbers. So I tried to do extra things to build those numbers. And we always had really, really good kids. Not essentially good runners, but good kids. And good kids hang around good kids. So the more good kids I got, the harder working they were. Yeah. And it just helped. Okay. Uh, every coach has certain principles, philosophies, ideals that they you know, try to teach your athletes or try to show things to them. Like, what do you try to teach your kids, and how have you been able to communicate those ideas to them? Um, the, the big thing that, that, that I always tried to preach was, you know, dedication. You, know, you, you get good at distance running through doing the daily grind work, you know, and we always said we want to really focus on the times when people aren't running, summer, winter, you know, and, and during the competitive seasons, it's easy to be motivated. It's during the non-competitive seasons, the base building seasons, that you've got to be more focused. Um, you know, and we preached effort. You know, you come to practice, you do what's asked, and you give your best effort that day. When you go to a race, the end result of the race may not be what you want, but it's never an excuse not to give a good effort. You know, anybody who's a runner knows you'll line up, feel great, and the gun goes off, and you feel like crap. So. That's the hardest times to work. So it was for us. It was always effort, and it was always take pride in your performance, and then just be dedicated. And you have big teams every year, or you had big teams, <laughs> <laughs> but you will again. Uh, how are you able to keep everything organized, and how do you build relationships with all the kids without focusing on just one or two superstars? I, I think you know the two of the big things that help is one, being a teacher. Being a teacher, you, you just learn that you've got to teach to every kid in the class. And, it, and coaching is more or less teaching, you know. And the other thing that I always tried to do was if my kid were on the team and they were the worst runner on the team, how would I want that coach to treat them? You know, the, the hardest part about having 70, 80 kids is names. But the sooner you learn the names, you know, and, and I just, the way I always did it was, at the end of the season, you know the top seven on each team is going to get all of your attention. You know, the last three championship meets. Up to that point, those kids are supposed to be your leaders. And, and of course, you're watching them and working with them. But that's the time that you can spend, you know, talking to the other kids, asking them how they feel. Um, I tried to make it a point to talk to some of the kids that weren't in the top during warm-ups and cool-downs. You know, just talk to them and ask them how they feel and just, how was your day? And, just, we did a lot of like ice baths, and that's when we would socialize. We'd be sitting in the ice bath, you know. What I always try to do is teach them the routines, and then they could socialize during like the stretching routine, things like that. And then I would move around and talk to them. Yeah. And you've had some guys who've gone on to success in college, and other guys not so much. What separates a good guy from a guy who doesn't reach his potential, or a girl who doesn't reach their potential after high school? Well, I think the big thing is. What I always tell the kids is, if you're going to choose to go to college and run, number one, running should be the second choice. You know, not very many people get to go to the Olympics. Not very many people get to become professional runners. So you're going to school to go to school. And I always found the difference between, for me at least, between high school and collegiate running was collegiate running became almost more job-like and less team-like. And you don't know how you're going to react to that situation until you're in that situation. And those are decisions they have to make. Um, for the people who went on and were successful collegiate runners, I think they just thrived in that environment. 
you know, and for the people who were great here and went to college and, and didn't have great careers, I, I just think the environment maybe wasn't so much for them. And then, you know, you take these kids who are in high school and they're unbelievably dedicated. They give you everything they got and they get to college and I think sometimes they just get tired of it. You know, they, they realize that they're quickly running out of time to be a normal student and they want to experience that. And sometimes the normal student life and the competitive runner life don't go well together. So okay. they just make a choice. Yeah, it just, but it, I, I don't think success of a collegiate runner reflects much on a high school coach. You know, you got a new coach, new coaching style. It's just, it's the kid. You know, what, what are they driven to do? I enjoy the job-like atmosphere of collegiate running. Not all kids are. So it's their choice, and you know, they decide what they want to do. And what are the characteristics of the best teams you've had in the past? I mean, here, I, I don't think the characteristics of the team or the makeup of the team ever changed. It was always we had really good, hard-working kids. I um, think the really, really successful teams just had a little bit more talent. You know, we, we would go, and, and I mean, I hate to say this, our training regime didn't alter much in the whole time I coached. You know, if you went out and met a Seamount Wright kid and said, hey, what were Mondays like? They would say lactate miles or threshold miles because that's pretty much what we did all year round. Um, sometimes it changed depending on the time of the season. Um, you know, you get 90 kids out, the odds are one out of eight or nine of those kids are going to be really talented. So the bigger the team, the bigger the gene pool, the greater the talent pool. Um, and we just got lucky, and I mean, you can say lucky, hard work, whatever you want to say, that every couple of years we'd get these influx of kids, you know, where the last time that we won states, those two years in a row, I think we had six or seven girls running under 12 minutes, you know. And I think part of that's competitive atmosphere, and part of it's just getting the right group of kids, you know, because every coach that I talk to in the state and anywhere, they, they kind of know their stuff, you know, and right. you need the horses, you know, to show your stuff. Yeah. And I think sometimes it has to do with the atmosphere that the program's created, getting those kids to come out and attracting those kids. Sometimes I think it has to do with the area you live in. You know, if you're in an area that, that has a great youth running program, the odds are you're going to get more kids out every year. If you're in an area that doesn't, it's going to be harder to build. 